Well, thanks, Fred, and thanks for the great work that you're doing at Clarity. Uh, what a great partner to have. Uh, Bear County deals with all the very, very tough issues facing this community. And one of those very, very tough issues is what we're trying to do with respect to uh, children that are uh, getting in a bit of trouble. We have a detention center. We have a correctional system for juveniles. Uh, the psychiatry department of the uh, UT Health Science Center provides help for both of those places. We have a huge hospital system that Bear County is responsible for called University Hospital. It is a, a, a new building that we just built downtown, another million square foot building that we just built out in the medical center. And the Department of Psychiatry, Child Psychiatry, plays an important role with us because all of the pediatric services were transferred over to University Hospital just in the last year or so. So it's a, a key and critical uh, 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 part that Dr. Stephen Plisky in the school is doing for us. And we're fortunate to have someone that has that experience in this field as well uh, as the experience of some since 1986 serving on, uh, on the, uh, with, with UT Health Science Center. We also have a children's court that plays a key role uh, where neglected and abused children cases are handled. And Dr. Plisky and I were just talking that we churn so many kids. Uh, we, I think the legal system becomes a monster after so much time. And we're trying to sort out how, how can we do more at the front end on some of these difficult cases uh, that end up spending all our money on a legal system and uh, ends up throwing more and more kids into foster care. And you're talking about mental problems. They'll have that there as they're tossed from one family to the next. And that system is overloaded. So we're struggling. And Dr. Plisky has agreed to uh, help us sort of sort out, should we be doing things in a different way and trying to reach some of these families earlier and trying to help the children earlier and trying to stabilize families rather than just grinding through a legal system which is eating up all of the money. So there's a lot of, lot, lot of major issues to be facing for us and, and, and we're del delighted here, to be here today to introduce Dr. S uh, Stephen Plisky. He's the Chief of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of Texas. He's worked continuously at Clarity Child Guidance Center since 1983. He is currently serves as the medical director of Clarity CGC Outpatient Psychiatry Services. In this role, he oversees the care of psychiatrists and their work with children with a wider range of problems. He's been a member of the faculty at UT Health Science Center since 1986. He's been involved in an array of different issues during that period of time, from administrative to research to clinical and educational activities. He's done a great deal of, of research on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and the related disorders associated with that. He currently, uh, currently uses functional magnetic imaging to try to understand the mechanics of the medication of ADHD. He's the author of Neuroscience of the Mental Health Cl Clinician. He's been active in the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And he has stated, I have, a, I have felt a part of the Clarity Child Guidance Center since the day I arrived. Through Clarity, we have reached children who would, another, who would otherwise go without treatment. Nearly half the child and ad adolescent psychiatrists practicing in San Antonio have trained at Clarity through the partnership with UT Health Science Center. And he says, I am proud to be a part of the leadership of a caring institution. So Dr. Plisky, come up and please share your thoughts with us. Right. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here today, and uh, my topic, uh, let's, let's go back here, talking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, particularly managing difficult cases with both physicians and therapists uh, really struggle with. The uh, prevalence of ADHD um, has been much debated over the years. This is the results of a recent study by the Center for Disease Control. Now, in this study, they did telephone interview with parents. They were not able to directly look at medical records, but they would ask, this first slide shows asking parents, has your child ever been diagnosed with ADHD? 
and this is the percent of people who say yes. And you'll notice that the percentage varies widely across the states from a low of 4% in Utah to you know, highs of uh, nearly 13% uh, in Louisiana. In fact, there's that curious sort of duck dynasty belt that runs kind of between Louisiana, Kentucky, over to Virginia, where the prevalence appears to be higher than in other states. And we really have no idea what this uh, variation uh, is related to. But if you average this all together, you generally get a figure of around 8 to 10 percent where uh, the parent has said, yes, a health professional has told me that my child uh, has ADHD. Now, that's different from the issue of how many kids then are on medication. So this is asking the parents, has your child ever been placed on a medication for ADHD, even for just a couple days? And again, you see the numbers vary tremendously. But typically, uh, between uh, you know, roughly about, on average, about 8% of kids have been treated with medication at some point in their life. It's a little harder to get figures in terms of how many are on medication at any given time. We, we think probably around uh, 5%. But both these numbers have increased substantially over the last 20 years. And so we struggle both with accurate diagnosis and with the process uh, of providing appropriate treatment. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into detail about every one of the stimulant medications that are available for ADHD. There's, of course, now a wide variety. The methylphenidate products are all uh, broken down into these that you see on the list. They vary not, not in how effective they are, but largely in the mechanism by which the medicine is released into the body and how long acting they are. So Concerta, Focalin XR, Ritalin LA, or Daytrana tend to, can generally be given once a day, whereas the short acting medications uh, obviously have to be dosed multiple times. So these are the methylphenidate products, and then the amphetamine class are Adderall, Adderall XR, probably best well known, and Vyvanse is a more recent addition. So while Adderall is basically the left and right-handed <laughs> molecules of amphetamine mixed together, and hence gets called, its generic name is mixed salts amphetamine, the uh, Vyvanse is simply the right-handed molecule of amphetamine linked to the amino acid lysine so that it has a much longer uh, half-life in, in the body and thus a longer effective uh, time. So the, the physician is free to choose whichever one of these he, wish, he or she wishes in a given case. Uh, the bottom line, though, is, is you try one and it doesn't work, you should kind of move on to another one. Particularly if a methylphenidate hasn't worked, you want to do an amphetamine and vice versa. Now, they, if you'll bear with me here, I'm going to kind of do a little pharmacology because there's a curious factor about the stimulant medications which makes them, uh, what did I do? Sorry. That makes them different from uh, all of the other uh, commonly used medications. So in this graph here, uh, we see the blood level of, say, methylphenidate given in the morning. It rises very quickly and then it wears off. So the short-acting methylphenidate will last about four hours. Now, if you measure the child's behavior, uh, when they take the medicine, the medicine kicks in and the behavior improves, and then by about 11 o'clock, the behavior begins to deteriorate. You will notice that the blood level here and uh, you know, here and here are roughly the same, but the behaviors are dramatically different. So as, as a result, the medicine is most effective when it is entering the brain, not so much when it is leaving the brain. And you can see that a little bit better here. People often ask exactly what are these medicines doing in the brain. Well, uh, here is the, it says the methylphenidate effect on DA, that stands for uh, dopamine. Uh, so that is the uh, very light circles here. And this is uh, methylphenidate in the brain and methylphenidate in the blood. So the methylphenidate enters the brain very easily. And as it does so, it increases the amount of dopamine in the brain. And it's on this increasing arm that the medicine is most effective. And just very briefly, an important point here is that what the methylphenidate is doing once it gets in the brain is it's blocking these dopamine transporters 
increasing the amount of dopamine in the space between the neurons, that causes the dopamine to stimulate this very complex uh, series of enzymes that are in the, the neuron here. And once it does that, it seems that those effects are present for several hours, and it then doesn't matter how much methylphenidate is hanging around in the, the, uh, the brain once the methylphenidate has thrown the switch. So four hours later, you need another dose to throw the switch again. And basically, the long-acting medicines are ways to hold medicine in reserve so that four hours or eight hours later, you kind of whack the neuron again, so to speak. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, there's much written in the literature about the side effects of stimulants. Uh, if in this graph, the green bar is the report of the symptoms at baseline before any medicine is started, the uh, Yellow is the, the amphetamine product, and the blue is the methylphenidate. And the little marks here, uh, the asterisks and whatnot, tell you, uh, when, you know, when the rate of the side effect is significantly significant, statistically significant over the baseline. So you'll notice the most common side effects of stimulants are trouble sleeping, poor appetite. Now notice here is that a lot of ADHD kids are irritable at baseline. But in fact, in general, their irritability gets better when they're on medication. And strangely, that's true on average for anxiety, daydreaming, biting fingernails, and so on. If we look at things like sadness and, and uh, tics, side effects that people are often very concerned about or you hear about in, in the media, in reality, for the group of ADHD kids as a whole, these things actually get better when the kids are on medications. Now, individual children will have adverse events of mood problems, uh, you know, feeling slowed down, uh, the so-called zombie effect, but that is, in fact, quite rare, and it uh, goes away, of course, when the medication is stopped. Now, the one long-term side effects of stimulants that we do have some concern about is that they do appear to have some modest effect of growth. Um, it's not clear how many kids this occurs in. If you average a whole uh, group of uh, kids together, it probably comes out to about two centimeters over the course of three years, uh, ending up uh, that uh, and it doesn't become progressive. So in many cases, this degree of growth suppression is almost not detectable. You'd have to measure it very closely with a scale and plot it on a scale. It's not something you'd look at a person and say, oh, he's really short. Uh, he must have been on a stimulant medication. Uh, it's also not associated with any deficit in bone structure or muscles. So while it's something to be watched for, it is generally not something that is going to cause long-term functional impairment. And then finally, uh, ticks. Uh, it, it may surprise you that uh, when they've actually, as I say, when you actually look at studies, you don't find methylphenidate in general or stimulants in general produce more ticks than placebo. Uh, Ken Gadow, in back in 1999, did a lengthy study looking at kids who actually had both tick disorder and ADHD, treated them with stimulants, and really found they did particularly well on them. So again, we watch for ticks when we start the medication, but it is not a general side effect, not one that generally is going to cause serious problems. And of course, you would stop the medication if it occurred in, in a particular individual. Now, about uh, five years ago, there was a big hullabaloo about whether stimulants were associated with cardiac problems. And there was a brief period of time in which there was concern that every kid with ADHD should have an EKG prior to starting stimulant medication. So Shellman and, and her colleagues uh, looked at a huge group of kids, uh, uh, 240,000. They did this by looking at electronic medical records and compared them to about a million children who, had, who did not have ADHD and obviously had never been on ADHD meds. And they looked through these medical records at every type of cardiovascular effect they could imagine, sudden death, arrhythmia, stroke, et cetera, and they found absolutely no relationship between being treated with ADHD and any type of, of cardiac side effect. So routine EKGs or routine cardiac monitoring um, is, is not required for treating ADHD. 
So you have this wide array of stimulants. Your first decision is choose a methylphenidate, choose an amphetamine. Uh, then once you do that, you select the uh, particular product within that class. One very practical question is can the child swallow or not? The long-acting forms, some of them need to be swallowed whole, or if the child can't swallow it, then you've got to pop the capsule open and put the stuff in something so they can swallow it. That can be a bit messy. Uh, so very young children sometimes are started on more of the short-acting products. Uh, when you try any given stimulant, you're generally going to get about a 60% response rate. That is, people come back and say, my child's much better, his grades have improved, he's behaving better, and he's not having any significant side effects. And that's great. So that stimulant doesn't work. Usually if it's a methylphenidate, then you try an amphetamine or vice versa. Uh, and in that case, you'll get another 20%. People come back and say, this is great, this works just fine. And then you have this 20% of people who are either non-responders or they're very weak responders. Maybe the medicine helped, but it only made about a 10, 15% improvement, and there's obviously, that's not going to be sufficient. And there's a huge variation in how kids respond and no clinical predictors, no way that we can say in advance which medication is better. So I'm often asked by physicians, well, which one do you always start first? Well, I don't have one that I particularly always start first. If the family has heard good things about a particular thing or they have a nephew who did well on it, they feel more comfortable with it, then that's a perfectly good reason to start that, that particular medicine. People say, I don't want Ritalin. Well, Ritalin's okay, but you really don't like the name Ritalin, we can do something else. So there's a little bit of art in all of this as, as, as well as, as data. But uh, you, the key thing is that to, once you start the medicine, you want to uh, titrate or increase the dose appropriately. And uh, in your flash drives, and if you're with the CME, you have this laminated chart uh, with you. And the, the table that I'm showing here is there, which talks about how to dose the stimulants. So typically, if we talk about a, typically a child first grade, to third grade, you're generally starting, if you use Concerta as a kind of fence post, 18 milligrams a day would be a starting dose. As you go across the rows, you see essentially the equivalent starting dose for all the other products. And for a young child, we're going to go to a maximum dose of Concerta of 36 or a maximum dose of Vyvanse, depending on what you're ever using. Uh, as with an adolescent, you, an older adolescent, someone 100 pounds and up, you can start at a, at a higher dose and go to uh, 72 milligrams or these various equivalent doses along here. If you're treating adult ADHD or you're dealing with an older adolescent who's already adult size, you know, he's 170 pounds and he's 6'2", then you can go to the adult doses, which are as, a high, as high as 108 of Concerta, 90 of methylphenidate, or uh, 40 to 100, 40 of Adderall, or, or 100 of Vyvanse. Now, it usually only takes one to two weeks to kind of know whether a given dose of a stimulant is effective. You can talk with people on the phone, it's not sufficient, you can raise the dose. Certainly a month is more than enough time. Perhaps the most common mistake that I see made in the treatment of ADHD is physicians begin the starting dose, the patient comes back a month later, they say there's no improvement, they say, oh, well, let's stop that, and they move on to something else. Or they send them to me and say, well, he's a stimulant non-responder, so I want you to weigh in. And then I say to the parents, well, how high did the dose go? Well, we started 18 and it didn't work, so we stopped it. And then um, I usually say, well, given your child's size, let, let's try again at, at a little bit higher dose. So when I'm talking with parents about the side effects, I first I list all the common side effects, the loss of appetite, the headaches, the insomnia, the uh, rare side effects that, that are not likely to happen, but the parents should be on the uh, uh, lookout for. And these would be ticks, and in, in ticks I would include the biting of fingernails. Some kids very rarely will get this sedation or perseverative effect where they seem sight of slowed down. This is the so-called zombie effect. In the lay media, it is 
inappropriately sometimes reported that this zombie effect is somehow the goal of treatment, that we're giving the medication to slow kids down or keep them out of trouble by sedating them. And that's obviously not true. If this effect occurs, the, the, the natural response is to just stop the medicine. Uh, the long, one long-term side effect is talk about the growth reduction, as I say, is, is probably very, is very minor. Uh, and then there, anyone can have an idiosyncratic reaction to any medication. People can take penicillin and have a serious allergic reaction. There's nothing like a penicillin reaction or, or, or some, you know, in some ways stimulants are safer than penicillin because nobody had, there's no reports of any massive allergic reaction uh, the way there is to many antibiotics. But extremely rarely people can have halluc uh, hallucinations. They can become very agitated and activated, usually when there's some other psychiatric disorder present in addition to the ADHD. So I always tell people, if your child has any unusual change in personality, any unusual effect, you just stop the medication right away. And given that stimulants are always out of the body every night, there is no withdrawal effect in the sense that you have to taper down on the medication gradually. If there's a problem, you can just stop it right away. Now, uh, if the stimulants are not um, working, there are other alternative medications that we can look at. Uh, probably one of the best well-known is atomoxetine or Stratera. Now, earlier I spoke, when I was talking about, showed you those pictures of the neurons, I showed you dopamine neurons. Stimulants also, in addition to blocking the reuptake of dopamine and, or increasing the amount of dopamine, they also increase the amount of norepinephrine, much in the same way the Stratera is doing here. So there's the Stratera. What makes Stratera different is that it only blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine. And so if there's more norepinephrine in the cleft, there's then more communication with this neuron going forward. Now, unlike the stimulants, which are given every day and then are out of the body, atomoxetine is more like other medications. It needs to be maintained at a relatively steady state in the bloodstream. And so it is given every day. You have to reach the therapeutic dose and stay at it for a couple of weeks before you see the full effect. Now, at st Stratera or atomoxetine, unlike the stimulants, it's not a controlled substance, so it's very convenient to use. It can be called into the pharmacy, et cetera. So why isn't Stratera just used more widely than the stimulants? Well, unfortunately, on average, Stratera is not quite as effective as the stimulants. So uh, this study was done where Concerta, which again is long-acting methylphenidate, the Stratera and placebo were controlled, were compared for six weeks. And the uh, Stratera was more effective than the placebo, but not as effective as the Concerta. So generally, we view the atomoxetine as a second-line agent. So typically, if a child has already been on several stimulants, then uh, we'll say, well, then let's go ahead and do the trial of the Stratera. And as far as the side effects of, uh, oops, side effects of the Stratera, the common ones are stomach upset, sedation. Uh, in the package insert, there's discussion of suicidal ideation. You can see the numbers here, 0.37% versus zero on placebo. Uh, the, this is obviously something you need to discuss with families or warn them about it. But in fact, it's not clinically important. By that, I mean, all the times I've used Stratera, I have not run into this, this particular side effect. But given that it did show up in the, the studies, it is something we always make families aware of. And of course, we tell them to stop the medication if uh, anything of this sort would occur. So when you dose uh, the atomoxetine, you start with uh, 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, and you go up to 1.2 milligrams per kilogram per day. Uh, so typically, if you had an eight-year-old boy, you'd start with 18, and then you can increase to as much as 20. Most of the time, we are dividing this, uh, you know, twice a day. Usually, Stratera is taken in the morning and then again in the evening. If someone's already on a stimulant and they're not doing that great, we will stop the stimulant 
introduce the atomoxetine, and in some cases, atomoxetine com combined with the stimulant. And we'll have time, I'll talk more about that later. Now, the final class of medications for ADHD are the, what we call the alpha agonists. The reason we call them the alpha agonists is there are alpha receptors, these are the green little triangles here that are both on the neuron that releases the norepinephrine as well as the neuron that accepts the norepinephrine. And the uh, alpha agonist, whether it's clonidine or guanfacine, mimics the action of the norepinephrine. So if they clamp on to this receptor, they actually decrease the amount of norepinephrine re that release, it is released. If they clamp on to the postsynaptic receptor, then they're actually mimicking the effect of the norepinephrine. So you've got this curious effect with norepinephrine that it could be either increasing it or de decreasing it or maybe both at the same time. Now, the, uh, traditionally, for many years, we just had generic guanfacine, which also went by the trade name Tenex. And it uh, would, its blood level would rise very high and then drop down. Then uh, Shire developed guanfacine XR or Intuniv where they spread the dose out a little bit and it doesn't peak uh, uh, as, as much. And that Intunium was the product that they then did studies for in order to get uh, the uh, approval for the FDA for the product. And basically this is a study, a five-week study, the black line are the kids on placebo, and you can see that all the different doses of the GXR or the Intunium were superior to the placebo and hence, uh, hence the the medication is available to use. The, now, uh, the guanfacine or the clonidine uh, are both very different medicines from the stimulants, whereas the stimulants have side effects of loss of appetite, headaches, trouble sleeping. The principal side effect of the guanfacine is uh, sleepiness or fatigue. But actually, as you will see, we can potentially use this side effect to our advantage. And clonidine ER, which is CAPFE, uh, also is better relative to placebo. CAPFE, though, is more sedative and more likely to lower blood pressure than the guanfacine. Uh, so that, that's something always for physicians to keep in mind. Now, one of the interesting things about the alpha agonists is that they can be combined with the stimulant medications. So in this study, they took um, the... Uh, ADHD kids who were already on stimulants, and the stimulant was not totally effective. So the parents said, he's better than nothing, but there are still a lot of problems. And they used a, a baseline ADHD rating scale that where it runs from 0 to 54. So if the average is in the high 30s, you can tell that they're still on the upper end of the range. And these are all the different stimulant medications they are on. This is the generic name for Adderall, the generic name for Concerta, and the generic name for Vyvanse. So a good mixture of different stimulants. So what they then did is they either added placebo, that's the gray bar, or they added the guanfacine XR, the Intuniv, and they added it either in the morning or the evening. And this is the number of good responders. So you can see that uh, if when the kids, when the medication was the, the Intunib was combined with the stimulants, you had more positive responders when, than just giving placebo. So this kind of justifies what was kind of already a long-standing practice, which is to combine this alpha agonist medicine with the stimulant when you've got kids who are not fully responding to the stimulant. And you can do the same thing with, uh, with the CAPVE, the clonidine XR. So in this graph, down is good. So this is placebo plus methylphenidate and placebo plus amphetamine. Uh, when you add the methyl, when you add the clonidine XR or the, or the, either the methylphenidate or the amphetamine, you see the bar goes down further. Although the effect wasn't quite statistically significant, the, the direction of the effect was was the same. So uh, when you again, this chart is in that handout. Uh, when you're uh, dosing the CAPVE or the Intuniv, it's kind of interesting coincidence that the CAPVE or the Intuniv dose is exactly 10 times that of the CAPVE, so that kind of makes it easy to remember. So uh, you 
do you change the dose every two weeks. So with Intuniv, it's one, two, three, and then with Capve, it's 0.1. Uh, then in the in the evening, then the the point two, but it's split BID and then up to 0.3. And then in older people, you can, bigger people, you can go as high as four milligrams of Intuniv or 0.4 a day of Capve, but divided be twice a day. BID is twice a day. Uh, QHS is at bedtime. And then if you're using the old fashioned, uh, I shouldn't say old fashioned, that sounds pejorative. If you're using the short acting generic and inexpensive medication, then uh, in the dosing is the same. It's just that you're dividing it up through the day. So for Guanfacine that is generally divided twice a day, BID, or three times a day, TID, uh, and same thing with the clonidine. So we can also use the alpha agonist when a child with ADHD has tics. Either he already has tics at baseline, he has a tic disorder, or he develops a tic as uh, part of the, uh, as a result of the stimulant treatment. So a typical situation is you start uh, stimulant A, uh, behavior improves, but the ticks emerge. So you can try to decrease the dose. Uh, if that doesn't work, you switch to a different stimulant. Uh, you can try the non-stimulant medicine, you know, Stratera by itself or Capve or Intunib by itself. But the parents may come back and say, well, these don't cause the ticks, but they're not really helping the ADHD in which case you would put them back on the stimulant medicine that produced the fewest number of ticks, and then you could add the alpha agonists, uh, either the Intuniv or the Capve, to the stimulant and hope to get the best of both worlds. That you uh, are improving the ADHD and then the alpha agonist prevents the ticks. So your overall pharma pharmacological algorithm, the one you want to keep in your mind, is you always start with a sing single stimulant, dose it according to the chart, make sure you get to the maximum dose, assuming side effects don't get in the way, and change from one stimulant class to the other. Then if that doesn't work, you can look at a trial of either Stratera, Capve, or Intuniv as monotherapy, that is using those drugs to treat them by themselves. Uh, I would particularly do that if there was no zero clinical response to the stimulants or severe side effects to the stimulants. On the other hand, you may have these kids where they're a little bit better on the stimulant. You've, you've gotten to the max dose and they're 30% improved, but they're still having problems at school. They are uh, still um, acting out at home. Then in that case, that's the ideal situation to combine the stimulant and uh, the alpha agonist together. And with the Intunib, you, can, you usually start it in the morning uh, along with the stimulant dose. On the other hand, the study shows you're, you can just as easily do it in the evening. And since the Intunib or all the alpha agonists have sedation as one of their side effects, if you have a youngster who the stimulant is causing insomnia, by giving the Intunib in the evening, you may, uh, able to, you're able to uh, uh, deal with that insomnia and thus kind of take care of the whole situation. Now, when the first phase of, of dealing with ADHD is uh, often very straightforward or even very gratifying. Everybody sees the immediate response to the medication. People are quite grateful. But then you have to hunker down for the long term because typically ADHD symptoms don't begin to resolve spontaneously until at least late adolescence. And for at least a third of people with ADHD, it doesn't resolve in childhood. They continue to have problems as adults and the treatment of adult ADHD is now well uh, accepted. And there are a number of problems that come to the clinician that need to be dealt with. The first is the so-called rebound. That is, when the medicine wears off at the end of the day, there is a period where the child is more active or more agitated or more irritable. So you get a situation where things are great at school, but the teacher is very happy and the grades have improved, but when they get home at night, they're actually more difficult than they were to begin with. The other is dealing with comorbidity or co-current concurrent problems. The ones I'm going to focus on today are oppositional defiant disorder, aggression, and mood lability or mood dysregulation. 
And particularly in this latter one, you're talking about when is it just mood dysregulation versus when are you getting into the area of bipolar disorder and depression. And then I'll talk about what I um, sort of half-jokingly call psychodynamic psychopharmacology. That is the process of managing the office visit in such a way that uh, both parent and child, you know, feel comfortable about what's going on and feel kind of empowered to deal with the problems. Now, uh, rebound, uh, medic again, medication wears off and the behaviors not only return to baseline, but they're worse. So a key question to ask the parent, are you really sure this evening behavior, is it just that it's the ADHD behaviors you haven't dealt with or, or, or have just returned the way they always have been, and you're seeing the contrast between on medicine or off the medicine, <coughs> or is it de indeed worse? Um, is the, is the uh, irritability worse actually when the medicines are fully on board, uh, or is it only when the meds wear off? This is a key question, because if the behavior is better during the day, and the behavior's worse only in the evening, then that's rebound. On the other hand, if the irritability is worse at the peak time of the stimulant in the middle of the day, that's a side effect of the stimulant. The stimulant is inducing a negative mood. And in generally, in that case, you're going to want to stop that stimulant and kind of move on to a different approach. When you're just dealing with rebound in the evening, then you're probably going to keep the stimulant during the day because that's doing pretty well, and then you got to look at some options for treating the rebound. So if the rebound occurs at 4 p.m., uh, then, of course, uh, the, uh, you, one option would be to increase the AM dose of the long-acting stimulant, because maybe it's long-acting, but not quite enough. It's, it's supposed to last till 5 or 6 o'clock, but it's going off at 2.30. So you start at 18 of Concerta or 30 of Vyvanse or Focalin XR5 and school is better, but it's worse right after school. Well, you have room to go up on that AM dose. Go ahead and maximize the AM dose according to the chart. Now, uh, particularly true if there's a little bit of room for improvement in daytime. Things aren't perfect yet. On the other hand, let's say everything is perfect at school can't possibly improve it. Everything's exactly where it should be, but now we're dealing with um, the, uh, the rebound after school. Then you want to add a short, a short acting dose of whatever product they are on in the morning. So if they're on a methylphenidate in the morning, obviously add a methylphenidate in the afternoon. If they're on an amphetamine in the morning, add an amphetamine in the afternoon. Now, if this rebound is occurring very late in the evening, you know, it, you know, the kid, the, it's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night, around the time the kid is getting ready to go to bed, then obviously you're not going to want to add a stimulant that late. That might be, if it's mainly sleep problem, the rebound is mainly causing sleep problems, then you want to add a sh single short-acting dose of an alpha agonist, usually the short-acting clonidine, because it's very sedative and you want the kid to go to bed. If the rebound is kind of 4 or 5 o'clock, it's just throughout the night, and it has a lot of irritability associated with it, then rather than adding the stimulant, you might consider adding the long-acting alpha agonist, the CAPFA or the Intuniv, in that particular situation. So the distinction is, you know, ADHD symptoms are just a rebounding, but it's all, he's hyper and he's bouncing off the walls, but his mood is fine, go with the short-acting stimulant. If it's Yes, he's hyper and he's bouncing off the walls, but he's also cranky and he's crying and he's having meltdowns, then you might go with the alpha agonist. And finally, just to reiterate, if he's irritable all the time through the day, that's a negative mood state and you don't want, then you want to change the stimulant. So a lot for primary care doctors, um, a lot of problems can be dealt with if you properly deal with rebound. And generally, you should not view rebound as a reason for psychiatric referral. If the kid's mood is fine in the day, the teacher says he's great, uh, and it's just this two, three hours when it wears off that it's a problem, he doesn't take the medicine on the weekend and everything's fine, well, obviously, the kid ha doesn't have a depressive disorder that only lasts between 5 and 8 o'clock at night. They, they, so, say, so you don't want to tie up your referral line with this type of case. Now, once you work through all this rebound and it continues to be a problem, then that's a different matter. 
So here's various ways to sculpt the doses in terms of daytime doses, afternoon dose. I'm not going to go and read these off to you. You can obviously look at them your, yourselves. So again, add that alpha agonist for the hyperarousal, the uh, partial response, the sleep issues, and the ticks, as we've already discussed. Um, so again, here's a little more fine-tuned recommendation. Sleep problems only. You want to look at the clonidine. Don't get into massive doses of clonidine at bedtime. So you're given 0.1. That worked okay, but the parent says there's a problem still. Go 0.2, but don't go over 0.2. There are sometimes parents that just get obsessed with having their parents go to, their kids go to sleep, and they're giving extra clonidine, and that over 0.2, that can be potentially dangerous. Uh, so I really, really hold the line on that. Irritability in the evening only, you can use the uh, uh, guanfacine IR. On the other hand, for the all-day irritability or the partial response, you can then add the, uh, the, uh, the Intuniv. Right. Now let's uh, talk about the uh, sort of some behavior management principles uh, that are unique to ADHD. And here it is critical to understand the psychology of the ADHD. And the first point with ADHD, there is no why. All right. Why? They come in, why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? We've explained it to him a hundred times. Doesn't he understand how this makes me feel? Why is he doing it? There is no why. The frontal lobe exists for the sole purpose of stopping you from doing stupid things. All right. And it has evolved over 200,000 years to do that. For whatever reason in ADHD, the frontal lobe doesn't do that. And it's not, that's unfortunate. You know, there's no, there's no point in asking why. It's just a pointless discussion. You just, you know that your child has, or this child has problems with impulse control. They always think in short term. So the teacher says, study your spelling words. We are going to have a test tomorrow. And the kid says, I don't want to study my spelling test. I want to play my video game. So they go home and say, do you have a spelling test tomorrow? No, I don't. And they play their video games. In their mind, they are ahead of the game. Because at that moment, they are not studying boring spelling words. They are playing their video game. And so when they go and they get an F, oh crap, I got an F, uh, I'm going to get grounded, so I'm not going to take this paper home and get it signed the way I was supposed to because I don't want to get grounded. And on and on it goes. And it, it, so you, it's only by being aware of that in advance and, and building the environment around the child to account for that that you're going to make progress, just as if you know, if, if, a, if a child is in a wheelchair, you're going to put a ramp to get them up into the house or get them where they need to go. You're not going to sit around going, well, why can't they walk? Why can't they walk? You don't build the damn ramp and get them up there. So you have to do the same thing. I got to communicate with the teacher every day to know what it is that we're going to do. And for any teachers in the audience, it's the same rule. If the parent is cooperative, and I realize that sometimes is not always the case, but if they are cooperative, don't get annoyed if the parent, or feel the parent is being a helicopter parent, if they are emailing, you know, what does Johnny have due today? That's a good thing for the ADHD child. Now, naturally, parental ADHD traits are themselves a problem. If the parent has ADHD or is impulsive and disorganized, that's a big deal because ADHD kids need more organization, more structure than the average child. So obviously, if you're a parent and you recognize the ADHD symptoms in yourself, certainly try to get them uh, there treated. And there's just, I haven't reviewed it yet, but there's just a study come out in CNS Drugs this month about treating adults with ADHD who are parents and observing the effects of the medication on their parenting behaviors. And in general, their parenting behaviors improve. Now, ADHD children do not process rewards and punishments in the same way that typically developing children do. They always go for the immediate reward. They cannot delay gratification. This has been shown in the laboratory over and over again. Give Johnny, do you want to have a quarter now, or we'll send a dollar to your house in three weeks? The typically developing kids said, give me the dollar. 
the ADHD kid says, no, give me the quarter. Uh, and that, that, that infuses every part of their life. I'm going to class, my friends are here talking, I'm gonna sit here and talk with my friends because that's the immediate reward. More um, interesting is that social rewards are not, in the words of behavior management scientists, they are not salient, i.e. they are not as rewarding or reinforcing. So for your typically developing child, you made straight A's, that's great, I'm so proud of you, you know, that just is really wonderful. Um, for ADHD kids, you know, not so much. You know, I had a kid yesterday in the office, I said, well, how are your grades? Yeah, they're okay. His mother said, oh, well, he made straight A's. And he's sitting there, oh, yeah, okay. Because that symbolic awareness is just doesn't, it just doesn't give you those, that, as much uh, of a pizzazz as a concrete reward. Now, playing Xbox, now that's a reward. Six bucks to go buy something at the store, that's a reward. So all of the rewards and the consequences need to be very concrete. That doesn't mean you certainly continue to include the social praise or the critique when it's necessary, but you cannot depend on that alone. Now, this is Psychology 101, uh, the, um, and, and yet it has to be done and it can't be talked about enough. And therapists in the room, let me tell you a few things that Chap my butt as a psychiatrist. <laughs> you take my patients and you do play therapy with them. Stop doing that. And I get so upset when I talk to the, my patients. I go, I see you see Dr. X, or I hear you see Mrs. G. What you do? Well, we talk about my day and we play. And you do anything else? No. Now, of course, the kid, maybe he's an ADHD kid, he doesn't remember. That was last week. But I, it is extraordinary how many people continue to do kind of open-ended therapy with ADHD kids when the bulk of the time needs to be spent with the parent. Now, granted, parents, same thing. They want to drop, they want to drop the kid off at the therapist's office, let the therapist dip them in the magic therapy, and that they're somehow going to change. We've been going therapy for three months. Nothing's changed. What has he been doing? Well, he's playing checkers. Well, that's not going to do it. You got to sit down with the therapist yourself and talk about some of the things that are going on. Uh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. and I have families. I have to educate my style when I do medication management. Is I really focus on. I ask a lot of questions about symptoms and how they're doing because my goal is to optimize the medications. And I get parents who want to tell me stories. Well, you should hear what he did last week. You know, he hit his sister, and, and I told him not to, and he called me the B word, and, and they're going on and on and on, when the details of that story, as painful as that is for them, are not going to help me adjust the medication. What that parent needs to do is go to the therapist and not spend 45 minutes reiterating the story with the therapist, but working actively with the therapist. Okay, let's break that incident down and see how we're going to do it differently. So um, I give people this chart, and these are just typical goals. I usually always have do things first time ask, because that kind of covers the waterfront of oppositional behavior. And then I put usually two goals that are individualized for the, for the uh, patient. And zero is bad, one is pretty good, and two obviously is excellent. And what I tell parents to do is in the afternoon, uh, you uh, give the child a rating and you total the points at the bottom for the day. If there are any zeros for the day, if they get at least one zero, then there's a restriction for that evening. Can't watch TV, can't play video games or whatever. If you make at least all ones, then you have your evening privilege. And you continue that process on. I, I generally go day by day, I generally advise parents to start on a Saturday and then come through and, and the total for the whole week is done on Friday. And uh, typically 21 points would be a perfectly average week. So usually I say if they're below 18 points, then there's a restriction for the weekend. Uh, if they're more than 30 points or 28 points, then you get to do some special activity on Saturday and Sunday. And of course on Friday an allowance is paid based on the number of points. And it's the consistent payout that's more important than the amount. So depending on the family's economic means, they can do 
10 cents a point, 50 cents a point, a dollar a point, whatever you want to do. And then the kid can take that money, he can save some of it if he wants, or, or he can then go to the store and, and buy a toy or whatever the case may be. Older kids, adolescents, obviously, they can go shopping, clothes, etc. cetera. The, uh, they can also, the final step here is to kind of make one of those fundraising thermometers and color in the amount of points for the week, and when the kid gets to some grand total of points, then he can get, he or she can get some extra special activity or some extra special toy. And what this does, I tell parents to say, is that <clears throat> in a sense, they tell the kid they're starting out with a three twos every afternoon or every day. And then in the day, if things start to get shaky, you can say, well, you know, you've been at a two up to now, but it's getting, it's getting uh, a problem. If you don't pull it together, I'm going to whack you down to a one. And then if they're at the one, you say, well, you're at a one now. Don't blow it or you're going to be at a zero. It gives, you, it gives the parent some leverage beyond just nagging and yelling and so on. And um, the, also, if, if therapists in particular can ask people to do this every week and bring them back. Now, granted, some parents just can't do it or won't do it or whatever the case may be. They're often, they're, sometimes there's logistical problems, the parents working the evening. Obviously, it doesn't work 100% of the time, but it certainly works better than just uh, sort of doing kind of open-ended uh, therapy with, with, with ADHD kids. And this is something uh, physicians can do as well. Yeah, right now, I, I, I basically took about six minutes to explain this whole thing. You can have stacks of these in the office. You can write out the instructions and attach them to the back. And so when the parent says, oh, I'm having trouble managing his behavior, you can pull one out of the, out of the chart, out of the, the thing you have there in the office that has all your handouts and say, well, here, why don't you try this? And uh, when people say, oh, that didn't work, we tried that, I, I always say, well, this is the best that science has shown work. And you know, you really got to give this a try. And even the other thing I say is even when it's not working in the short term, it may be working, it may work in the long term as far as helping the child manage their, their behavior. Now let's talk about uh, comorbidity. This is in the, the, the uh, practice uh, that we have, uh, which is a psychiatric practice, so it's much more impaired than say what you would see in a primary care setting. You would see out of this large number of kids, about 40% had what I call ADHD simplex, that is ADHD and no other disorder, large proportion of kids with ODD and CD, and then around the edge of the ODD C, uh, CD circle, you see the kids with BP or bipolar disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, mood disorder, NOS, and depression and anxiety. And then at the time I did the study, the autism spectrum circle was relatively small, I think if I repeated that, that circle would probably be expanding by now. Now, we always want, in ADHD, we want to distinguish between depression versus dysphoria. So major depressive disorder is going to be weeks of daily, most of the day depression, ongoing suicidal ideation, neurovegetative signs, guilt, remorse, suicidal acts. Uh, there are Things in ADHD that simulate that, which you could call depression if you really wanted to, but probably will not respond to an antidepressant medication. So ADHD kids have brief periods of irritability or unhappiness. They're angry at themselves when they're frustrated or done something that messed their lives off, and they may say things like, well, maybe I'll be better off dead, but it's not ongoing suicidal ideation. Um, poor sleep is a feature of major depression, but then you got to always bear in mind that being a night owl is relatively typical of ADHD. People who are depressed tend to be guilty, remorseful, always negative on themselves. I run in a lot of ADHD kids who tell me, they don't use these words, but this is essentially what they mean. I'm depressed because I can't have fun all the time. Why are you feeling sad? Well, my parents think I should do my homework. I have to get up every morning and go to school. You know, and I'd rather be doing other fun things, and I, instead, the world requires me to do all these other things that I find incredibly boring. Um, people will, uh, obviously, depressed people have uh, suicidal acts, and ADHD kids, because they're uh, very impulsive in some severe situations, the, the cutting behavior tends to be more an expression of anger or a self-stimulatory activity when they're extremely bored. Now, I'm not minimizing the symptoms in the right column, 
What I'm saying is that these are a cluster of symptoms that may not respond very well to antidepressant medication and in fact might be a better focus of therapy. And I tend to only use antidepressants more in the full-blown depressive episodes. Now there's a new diagnosis that I'm sure um, Dr. Duder mentioned, the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Uh, these are kids with chronic irritability punctuated by explosive outbursts. And you can read the criteria yourself. So now in DSM-5, bipolar should be kids who have an at least five-day period of definite mania associated with um, the grandiosity, uh, pressured speech, flight of ideas, sexual acting out, etc. And they generally return to some kind of, of uh, euthymic or, or, or less disturbed baseline. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorders are people who are chronically irritable and then have the aggressive outburst stuck on top. And then the irritable, the intermittent explosive disorder are kids who just have aggressive outbursts and then return uh, to baseline. Uh, so this brings up the big elephant in the room, when should the antipsychotic be used in ADHD for aggression? And there's no doubt that antipsychotics are very effective for aggression. The problem is they're associated with a lot of serious side effects. So this is a big deal, not something, oh, he's being kind of aggressive, well, here's some, here's some Abilify, here's some Risperidol, you know, like, you know, come back in six months. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, this study that just came out by uh, Michael Amann and colleagues uh, looked at, a, took uh, 168 aggressive ADHD kids, randomized them to either get stimulant or first, it, uh, ran, first gave them stimulant and behavior therapy for a run-in period and then randomized them to either ha get placebo added or get risperidone added. And what they found, so this is where the risperidone is started. What you can see is a lot of the kids improved dramatically in their aggression just with the stimulant and the behavior therapy. When they added the, the risperidone, the risperidone was clearly better than the placebo. So that's important to know. This is a scientifically justified approach. But you can see this difference is not anywhere ne as big as this difference. So we should always try, when we've got an ADHD aggressive kid, we should always try to get as much bang for the buck as we can from just treating the ADHD and doing the behavior therapy I talked about. But when our back is against the law, against the wall, the aggression is life-threatening, it's dangerous to sell for others, then that may be the point at which we need to add the, the antipsychotic medication. So again, add the antipsychotic when there's uh, significant physical aggression. When you have aggression in multiple settings, danger to sell for others, and the psychotherapy has not been helpful, or in some cases, it is not available. And the reality is sometimes it's made necessary by the failure of, of other, uh, other systems. So, you know, there's not the residential treatment or the therapeutic foster homes or all the other kinds of things that might be available. And we've got to be a little bit careful of a medical model of aggression that kind of just says, well, aggression is treated with antipsychotics or treated with medication. Uh, so, you know, people come in and say, well, he was aggressive last week, so he, we need to increase the medication. I think that if that becomes too much of a cliche, I think there are dangers. And that's coming from me, who are a strong advocate of treating aggressive behavior with medication when appropriate. All right, we have, I believe, a little time for questions. Yes, we do. All right. And if you would stand up when you ask your question and project so every, oh, there's microphones here. There's a microphone here and here. So please come to the microphone if you're asking a question. That will allow us to have more questions because then I won't have to repeat them. Hello, um, Rochelle Flynn, I'm a pediatrician. Um, actually, my question is um, regarding like, I don't know how to phrase this, like regarding like social situations and stuff, some families are more chaotic. How do you differentiate um, all of the ADHD, the conduct, the um, oppositional stuff from just unstructured environment, lack of good parenting, and how do you know when to medicate versus 
therapy, and especially if you have families that refuse to go and aren't compliant with that kind of therapy? I, um, I that's, a, that's a very good question and uh, complex issues. Uh, typically if, um, one, one way I look at is kids who are doing relatively well at school and the problems are mainly in the home, then I'm more likely to stand my ground and say I don't think medication is needed in this situation and you must or you should go to therapy. If uh, the school is out of control, the kid is not learning, not doing well, being aggressive at school, then I'm more likely to say, well, I really wish you would be in therapy, uh, but, um, the, uh, but the situation's urgent enough that I'm going to go ahead and, and treat. And uh, the, uh, I'm not always, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking maybe in a better environment, the kid would be better. And maybe he wouldn't need the medicine, but then, I'm, then I always realize that there isn't, any, there isn't going to be any other environment. That's the home that he's going to be in. And even if we get, and then the, the final, the, the, the rubber really meets the road when you look at the results of the medication. If they improve dramatically on the medicine, you feel a little more comfortable that there is something biological going on. If there are multiple medications that just aren't working, then I think you're on stronger ground to say, you know, maybe this is not a medication issue, it's a psychosocial issue. Well, there's limits to how you can force it. it. It's an analogy. Let's take an analogy in diabetes, type 2 diabetes. You have come when someone come in and they're way overweight and they're not eating right. You say, well, you know, you wouldn't need your insulin if you lost weight and ate right. Uh, and uh, they say, well, thank you, doc, but I like the way I eat. And, but their glucose is 300. You know, the, you'd say, well, I gotta, you, got, you prescribe them the insulin, even though in your mind you're saying, man, I wish that patient would, would follow my advice and eat healthy. So it's an analogous situation, just as our society has, by providing processed foods and all these other things, we have an obesity epidemic. So to some degree, you know, we have the, the rise in ADHD may be partially driven by those things, but as a physician, you're, you're always acting in the interest of the individual child. Uh, th now, so it's always a subjective judgment. There's no, there's no gold standard. If the day comes that we have a diagnostic test for ADHD, you know, that we can do, we'll be on firmer ground to saying your brain is typically developing. There's no reason why you can't pay attention versus you clearly do have ADHD, but I'm afraid that's very far away. As the kids age into adulthood, what's your decision process for seeing um, if they can manage without the medications? Uh, the, uh, the question is, as kids age, what I usually tell parents is observe them during the periods that they're off the medication. And if they are doing, if their attention span and organizational abilities have improved dramatically and you don't notice a bi as big a difference as you used to, that's probably the first sign that they're uh, possibly ready to go off the medication. If there's an immediate deterioration when the stimulant medication is stopped, then, then you know, we're not ready to do that. The, um, and so if, if people say, well, I'm ready to take a try, I usually say, well, let's start the medicine the first six weeks of school, and then you can stop it, and of course, if, but keep in close touch with the teachers, and if there's deterioration, then just go ahead and restart the medication. Um, I have a question about um, aggression. You, you talked some about what you like to see done therapeutically with kids who ADHD is a primary problem. When aggression is a, a you know a big part of the picture, is there anything that you recommend in terms of the therapeutic work, and is there anything that you see coming back to you that suggests this is more useful than this? The uh of course, once the aggression, I, I've kind of, spo I've spoke today kind of in the framework of the child with ADHD and aggression without some of these other comorbidities such as depression and bipolar. When the aggression is present, you kind of go through that process of determining are there other psychiatric disorders present. Uh, and if they are, naturally you're going to treat those. The, uh, but the great bulk of these kids that have this severe mood dysregulation, um, it's, it, 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 is, it tends to all revolve around this, you know, what is, you know one of my patients, I, I think, uh, just said flatly, you know, people make me mad. 
And so his thinking was, the problem is that people are making me mad. I wouldn't get mad if people would not do this to me. <laughs> so he's trying to make me understand that somehow, you know, teachers and peers and all these other people just need to stop doing these things and he would never get mad. And then that would lead to a discussion, he would describe each incident of injustice that led to him getting mad. Well, the teacher said I didn't do the work and I did do the work and my brother, you know, used my Xbox and he didn't ask me to. And as a therapist, you can very much get lost in the weeds with all of this. And therapists are generally taught to be empathic, you know, reflect back what the patient is thinking. So many therapists find themselves saying, well, that must have made you feel very angry. Um, hoping that that will open the door to some underlying dynamics. Uh, when in fact a lot of the aggressive dysregulated kids are just sort of, may actually find that a reinforcement of their view that yes, the world is making me mad. So I, you know, these kids, I always say, well, maybe that's not exactly what made you mad. Maybe there's something other, some other big thing in your life that is making you upset. Is there something going on in the family? Is there something that happened to you in the past that's an issue? And, you know, 20% of the time I'll hit pay dirt. The kid will bring up something that, um, you know, is very significant. I say, well, maybe that's part of your anger and then the therapist can deal with that. But a lot of time I just get this, I just get mad and I say, you know, you need to understand you have to control yourself even when you're mad. That's kind of the starting point. So I'm very big on control. You have to control yourself. And I do that even to the point of allying myself with a parent whose parenting skills may not be that great. I think one trap you get into, you know, is they say, well, my mom, you know, the, you know, my mom called me a bastard. And, uh, you know, one thing is say, well, mom, you shouldn't be calling your child a bastard. Uh, the, rather, I'd say, well, you know, I don't know if your mom said that or not, but if she did said that, you must have done something that really made her mad. And uh, the, the, you shift the conversation to you need to be the one that controls your behavior. And then I think you're much more likely to, uh, you know, uh, kind of summon whatever residual self-control is there and build on it. Uh, stemming off of the question before, um, what research is there, if any, um, on the child going into adulthood and um, either getting off the medicine completely? Because I work at a placement a group home mm -hmm. for children who are in CPS care. So at that point, when they age out at 18 and they no longer, you know, whether they no longer stick with the caseworker or what have you, um, they just completely go off the meds. I know that the placements do work with them to um, taper down, but are there any significant side effects slash withdrawal effects of them completely going off of the medication, not only just their behaviors um, either increasing or worsening from when they were before, what they were before, but like kind of more of like the withdrawal, right. is there any kind of, since it is stimulants and amphetamines yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, the stimulants are not gonna be any negative side effects. They're out, as I was mentioning earlier, they're out of the body every night anyway. Now the mood stabilizers, they should be tapered off. Uh, in reality, many patients go off cold turkey and the withdrawal effects generally are those are, uh, they may be physically uncomfortable, you know, upset stomach, nausea, you know, occasionally some ticks or twitching, but they're not medically dangerous. So, you know, we don't worry about people having seizures or, or having some kind of uh, really serious medical reaction. The, for the ADHD itself, about a third of kids are pretty much ha are in remission by the time they're in adulthood. A third are clearly, clearly not in remission and are very symptomatic. And then there's a third that's sort of in between where they have some residual symptoms, but whether they experience them as impairing depends on the setting they're in. So two guys graduate from high school, one drives a pizza truck and the other goes to college. The person who goes to college may feel he's continued to be impaired because he has to concentrate a lot <coughs> more than the other fella. So the other fella says, oh, I'm fine, I'm getting along okay without the meds. And I believe we are at the ending point. So maybe I'll take this last question and then we'll... Uh, yes, this is, uh, I'm Dr. Sheikh, uh, one of the pediatricians. My point was what you just described, uh, you know, a lot of teenagers coming back for refills for, you know, schoolwork. How do you feel about that? And treating a four or five-year-old 
exhibiting typical behavior of aggression and okay. violence. Well, all right, we'll take the, the question of preschoolers. If, you know, four, I'm very comfortable with four and up, and I usually, in a preschooler, I require some evidence of the behavior outside the home. And most of the four-year-olds I get referred to me, that's fairly easy because they've been expelled from daycare, if you can imagine <laughs> such a thing. So if it's that severity of symptoms, I'm generally fine with, with treating it. Um, now, the, the, it is, there, it's a huge ethical dilemma about um, a lot of kids with ADHD, they, they want the diagnosis because they want accommodations in college and they only, you notice that they're only calling for their refill in November and in May when it's exam week. And so I'm obviously uncomfortable with that. I tell people, well, if you're not on the medicine most of the time, you're probably ready to be off it for good. The biggest problem with college ADHD is not people asking for too many refer refills, it's actually that they hardly do it. Or they get one refill in September and it somehow magically lasts, uh, you know, the entire three months of the semester. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it's beautiful.